Greetings, folks. My name is Ronwise Ganji, and welcome to Quick and Dirty Roleplaying. The title of this video is a result of trying to figure out the crux of my beef with D&D. I originally wanted to call it from RPG consumer to RPG creative, but the reality of the matter is that the vast majority of people who got into tabletop role-playing games did so through D&D. Now, in my opinion, what makes D&D so pernicious to not only most other tabletop role-playing games, but to the prospect of tabletop role-playing game diversity of thought is that it's managed to do what not even McDonald's has done to fast food. It uses its own brand as the name of the hobby. Imagine this scenario. Someone asks you, what are you up to? And you respond, I'm gonna go get some fast food. They look at you with a puzzled face and they ask you, what's that? And describing the concept of fast food is so arduous that you just simply say, I'm gonna go get McDonald's. And they go, oh, now I get it. That's what D&D has done to tabletop role playing, in my opinion. Well, it has most notably supplanted the name of the hobby with its own brand name, I think this phenomenon extends to other aspects of tabletop roleplaying to a lesser yet still significant degree. The way you roleplay is the way D&D does roleplaying, with a massive emphasis on skirmish combat. The way you create a character for a tabletop roleplaying game is the D&D character creation process of rolling for ability scores, picking your race, picking a class, and typically at level 1, jotting down class and racial features, picking an alignment, and selecting your starting gear and spells, if available. The way to think of your characters is in their current and future class features, and in their gear because they are ultimately combat units on an imaginary chessboard, because like chess pieces, if the rules don't say your character can do something, you can't, and on and on it goes with the way um, when you explain how like the different mechanisms of tabletop role-playing games they don't make the defaults to the way D&D does it. Now you can say wrong wise you're being too literal with how D&D is being meant to, is meant to be played if you don't like something about it then just change it. This is both a valid point and also a possible misunderstanding of why the game is designed as it is. At the end of the day, use the D&D rules as you wish in order to enjoy tabletop role-playing as you see fit. In fact, to me, this is the first step from simply being a D&D consumer to an RPG creative. However, this behavior is in direct conflict with how Wizards of the Coast and its parent company, uh, company Hasbro, wants you to interact with the product uh, because that is what it is to them it's a product while this may sound as if i'm going into conspiracy theory territory it's simply a matter of adhering to the profit motive the more the DD consumer relies on wizards of the coast to tell them what is legitimate regarding DD via their core rule books and their supplemental material aka the more they agree that only Wizards way is the right way, then the more their money goes to Wizards of the Coast and Hasbro. Hasbro. This is why I use the term D&D consumer. Now, is being a D&D consumer a bad thing? No, it's not, because at the end of the day, it's your life and you live it how you want. I do, however, find the level of D&D consumerism where the only legitimate material to use for D&D is from Wizards D&D product lines is disappointing. Even then, the very act of simply purchasing and or using third-party D&D supplemental material is a way of acknowledging that you don't need Wizards of the Coast to monopolize your wallet or your thoughts regarding what encompasses tabletop role-playing as a whole. The people that make these third-party products are a testament to what is to go beyond consuming D&D material and to producing D&D material. It takes time, dedication, skill, and dare I say, a sufficient financial and motivational support system to produce these high quality products. 
Uh, furthermore, I suspect these third party producers have the freedom to create and innovate in ways that people who work for wizards creating similar D&D supplementary material do not. Last but not least, uh, whether it's for the love of D&D or simply because they're capitalizing on popular trends, uh, these third-party D&D producers appear to make higher profits uh, than the creators of their tabletop role-playing game material, with the notable exceptions of big names in the hobby who have most likely worked on D&D products or content in the past. Uh, then we have the OSR movement. OSR, or Old School Renaissance, is a collection of tabletop role-playing games that attempt to harken back to older editions of D&D, but with better organization. At first, I was under the impression that an OSR game was one that attempted to capture the feel of dungeon-crawling adventure that D&D first introduced to the world back in the mid-70s. I was, according to, I was, according to responses that I received from both RPG.net and the RPG site.com, mistaken about my impression of OSR. Because the essence of OSR is basically a regurgitation of a zeroth or first edition D&D. While this still, while it's still above the die-hard Wizards of the Coast loyalist, I still perceive too much of the D&D is the only game I'll play mindset, just the older editions, from that crowd for my taste. Uh, personally, uh, one of the most clever reinterpretations of D&D that I've seen and played is Dungeon World. Uh, in fact, let me show you. I should have had this before I started this video, but uh, uh, aha. Dungeon World. So while it adheres to many of the D&D tropes, such as the classic races, classes, and ability scores, it plays it very differently from any edition of D&D while maintaining the feel of dungeon crawling adventure. For example, there's no delineation between combat time and non-combat time. So things like initiative or combat rounds don't exist. Instead, combat is just another part of the narrative and it feels more like watching a dynamic fight in a movie rather than play mini a miniatures war game. Not only was it exciting to run Dungeon World, I needed way less prep than if I were to run a D&D adventure. Uh, last but not least, <clears throat> If you want a masterclass of how to do the functions of a game master or what this game refers to as the MC, I think it refers to, it still refers to as Dungeon Master, but I don't recall. Check out this game. It's 25 bucks. You read it and you follow the rules of how to, you know, run a game for your for your group and you will be quite a good um, game master. After this, I couldn't go back to playing tabletop role-playing games the same old, in the same old traditionalist, simulationist way after that. Um, so this video is getting pretty rambly, so I'll just conclude with this. If you like D&D 5th Edition and you see no need to ever get it out of your comfort zone, more power to you. You have massive support networks available to you and the more money you shell out the more access you get to those support networks not only in products but in digital services now if you want to try something else and get your friends to play something else or find another group that'll play other games i wish you luck because dnd has a stranglehold on the tabletop rpg zeitgeist but if you don't relent your persistence will pay off in fact, I invite you to check out the Quick and Dirty RPG system on DriveThruRPG, developed by yours truly, so you can see an example of what's possible regarding role-playing game design outside of D&D. And as of the time of this recording, uh, what you decide to pay for it is up to you, whether at the time of acquisition or at a later date. And uh, that's all I have for this video. Uh, I do have plenty more to say about the subject, but I wanted to keep it relatively short. 
until next time folks take care and play to find out what happens